What's up, everybody? My name is Dimitri Kofinas, and you're listening to Hidden Forces, a podcast that inspires investors, entrepreneurs, and everyday citizens to challenge consensus narratives and to learn how to think critically about the systems of power shaping our world. My guest in this week's episode is Jimmy Sony. Many of you will remember Jimmy. He came on the podcast back in early to mid-2018 to talk about his last book, Mind at Play, which was an excellent biography of Claude Shannon. And he is back on the podcast today to talk about his latest book, Founders, which is about the infamous PayPal mafia and the lasting imprint that it's left on not only Silicon Valley, but the entire fintech and online payments industry. It's an amazing book, and this was an equally amazing conversation, not only because the history of PayPal and its star-studded founders like Peter Thiel, Elon Musk, and others is interesting in and of itself, but also because the company was in so many ways ahead of its time. It was fintech before anyone even knew what that word meant, and PayPal was one of the earliest pioneers of what former team member and later LinkedIn founder Reid Hoffman would dub blitzscaling which is what you do when you need to grow really, really fast. And that's what PayPal did. And they did it while under constant threat of extinction from not only criminals trying to defraud their customers or competitors trying to take their business, but also from each other. Because the story of the PayPal mafia is also the story of an unlikely, but nonetheless successful merger of two very different, but equally competitive cultures that of Elon's X.com and Peter Thiel's Confinity. My objective in bringing you this conversation today is to give you a historical context for many of the business practices that have since become standard operating procedure across both Silicon Valley and Wall Street. I mentioned blitzscaling, but PayPal was also early in pioneering many of the practices that are now considered central in fighting fraud on the internet including the broad scale implementation of CAPTCHA, that thing that pops up on a website asking you to prove your humanity, as well as the use of tiny deposits, in some cases, fractions of a cent used to verify account ownership. All of these innovations came out of a company under siege for almost the entire course of its pre-IPO existence. And it was in many ways that battle for survival that we discussed today and which was central shaping not only PayPal's culture, but its success, the type of success that every entrepreneur and every founder dreams of. Most of that part of our conversation, the conversation about fraud, using financial incentives to effectively buy customers and scale quickly, as well as a discussion about the intersection of fintech and cryptocurrency, are featured in the second part of our episode, available to premium subscribers through the Hidden Forces website at hiddenforces.io. Anyone signed up to our super nerd tier can also access the transcript to this episode, as well as the intelligence report, which is the cliff notes to the Hidden Forces podcast, formatted for easy reading of episode highlights with answers to key questions, quotes from reference material, and links to all relevant information books, articles, etc., used by me to prepare for this conversation. And with that, please enjoy this wonderful and deeply enriching conversation with my friend, Jimmy Sony. Jimmy Sony, welcome back from the 1990s. How does it feel <laughs> to be back? Thank you, Dimitri. It, it, you know, it's a weird place, man. Like the 2022, you all uh, got to take me back to the 1990s in some ways. <laughs> yeah. So your last book, uh, you were last on the show, I think it was the summer of 2018. Your book at the time was the biography of Claude Shannon, the father of information theory. How did you go from writing a book like that to writing one about a payments processor and the now star-studded, then still in their 20s roster of Silicon Valley entrepreneurs who have in many ways beat the odds and and managed to disrupt the financial industry two decades before digital currencies and fintech really even got on people's radars? Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, it's one of those things that I certainly didn't plan it that way because I, (laughs) who goes from Claude Shannon to Elon Musk. But what had happened is I had become really interested in clusters of talent that are kind of scientifically or technologically oriented, and then some not, just like artistic clusters too. Because I started to just, because I was researching Shannon and his time at Bell Labs, 
you know, Bell Labs was like, they were like an Olympic team of scientific minds, right? You have the invention of the transistor, touchtone dialing satellites, I mean, everything, right? Everything you and I take for granted in some way was built at Bell Labs. And so I started to think like, what are other clusters of engineers or scientists or computer scientists or just, you know, bright minds that are like that? And I gravitated to PayPal and just discovered in the course of my research that there were books kind of like, there was a memoir from someone who worked there called The PayPal Wars. There was Peter Thiel's Zero to One. There were Reed Hoffman's series of books about startup growth and development. But no one had actually gone back and done like the soup to nuts narrative history from 1998 to 2002 of how the company came to be. And what I kept finding is that, you know, people like I'd hear a little bit of a story somewhere and then the story would die off because the next seven paragraphs were about SpaceX, right? Or someone would do a little sentence and then the next, you know, three pages were about a firm or LinkedIn or whatever. It just turned out that everything these people did after 2002 was what captured press attention and media attention. But I really had this just instinct. I said, you know, they cut their teeth somewhere. They started at this place. So what happened? I think the way I write about it is literally I was asking the question, like, what was in the water? Like, how did all of you work at this one place at one time? And that's how I got from Shannon and Bell Labs to, you know, like sort of Levchin, Musk, et cetera, and PayPal. And the thesis was always that, you know, you, you have these stories that are told as like the lone innovator or the genius in a garage. But what happened if you had like an entire company of some of the most interesting, brightest minds from that era all work at one place? Like that couldn't have been an accident. And I wanted to understand what happened there. And then also to understand like kind of what what little imprints did it leave? Or what are the, some of the stories that time forgot? That sort of stuff. Mm. It's like the Avengers movie, man. <laughs> like if you if you Google PayPal Mafia, and you pull up the list of members. I have it right here. Peter Thiel, Elon Musk, David Sachs, Reid Hoffman, the founders of YouTube. And then you've got people like Max Levchin, who most people don't even know who that is. But he's on par with Thiel and Musk in terms of competitiveness and in terms of tech savviness. I think he was kind of the lead tech at both companies, even after the integration, right? Wouldn't Max Levchin have been like the, the biggest kind of geek among the founders. So where, not to like get too far ahead of ourselves here, so maybe we'll, we'll pull back and, and ask you about the origins of PayPal, because it, when we talk about the origins of PayPal, what we're really talking about is the origins of two very similar stories or parallel stories, but distinct ones. The origin of X.com, which is Elon Musk's company, and of Confinity, which actually was the progenitor of the name PayPal, which then became the name of the combined product. And that was started by Peter Thiel, Max Levchin, and a couple of other guys, I think, officially. Mm -hmm. I can't remember their names now off the top of my head. But what is the origin story of PayPal? Sure. So it's a classic example of, you know, they didn't set out to build the world's foremost payment processing system, right? Neither company actually started with that ambition. So on one side, you have a then young entrepreneur whose name is Elon Musk. And Elon has just sold his first company called Zip2 to Compact Computer. And he had had you know, inklings and, and, a, and a kind of instinct that financial services was going to be one of the next big domains that was disrupted by the internet. Again, just a reminder, context, like this is the 1990s, dial-up internet. You know, those of us who are logging onto the internet are suffering from our, our parents interrupting our downloads because they pick up the phone, right? In that era, Elon had spent a little bit of time working at a, at a bank, but had really just sort of been thinking a lot about the spaces that the internet would be applied to where it would be disruptive. And from his perspective, one of the spaces where technology had not advanced fast enough, far enough, or meaningfully enough was financial services. So his conception of his company and the name of his company was X.com. And the idea was it's going to do all things financial. And in doing all things financial, it's going to upgrade all these ancient databases and mainframes. It's going to improve all the technology. And because all your money and everything financial in your life is going to be in one place, you're never going to have to pay a transfer fee or a weird, you know, going from one place to another fee or a late fee or any of that stuff. He was like a war on fees. So that's X.com. It's going to be as he put it, he wanted it to be a revolution in finance. It should be the world's financial system, should be x.com. The other side of the PayPal ledger is this company that first it's called Fieldlink, then it's called Confinity, and Confinity births a product called PayPal. Fieldlink is the name of the company that Max Levchin starts in late 1998. 
that is invested in by Peter Thiel. Max had spent a lot of time studying mobile cryptography, mobile security, mobile devices. And at the time, we're not talking about iPhones. We're talking about like that Cassiopeia by, you know, by Casio. You're talking about the Palm Pilot. It was called Palm, later acquired by 3Com. The Sharp Wizard. I mean, this is like a walk down memory lane for a lot of people. So he has this notion that these devices are going to take over the world, but that they're bad, they're very insecure, that there's no security protocols built into them. So FieldLink's first iteration is we're going to build mobile libraries, mobile encryption libraries. That changes slightly to we're going to beam money between Palm Pilots. We're going to create like a digital financial transfer technology that allows you to use the infrared ports on Palm Pilots to transfer money. That product is called PayPal because it's a way for me to pay my pal Dimitri if we're at lunch and we need to split the check. You and I whip out our Palm Pilots and we use the infrared ports on the side to beam a couple bucks to each other. Buy nerds and- for nerds. <laughs> Essentially. And then to be candid, they admitted that too. They look back at it and they kind of laugh at it. Although, again, we know we live in an era of Venmo, so it's not infrared, but it does basically the same thing. But those are the origin stories. So you have actually two companies with two very different visions to you know two completely different origin stories and truth told like two very different sets of goals like they're not in this to win the emailing money payments race like Elon wants to build kind of the single clearinghouse for all things financial and Max and Peter are focused on mobile payments and mobile security and mobile technology yeah as usual Thiel and Levchin were more focused and Elon was more sort of world, even though the world domination index, I think started at Confinity, Elon was right off the bat wanted to uh, dominate the entire financial universe. He did. He did. Although there's a layer to it that's worth appreciating, you know, that I think is like sometimes it's really easy to miss, right? So what you just described is true, that he wanted the company to do mortgages, insurance, banking, brokerages, (laughs) savings accounts, I mean, everything, right? Which he's really describing a number of businesses one. But part of what underlies that, and it's important, and I would say my description of it is going to be insufficient relative to his understanding of it, is he believes, look, banks have written the code that runs their systems on very old code, right? He, When we were talking, he was cracking jokes about COBOL with me, which is just hilarious. So he says, okay, you've got all this old code. Here's what happens. It means that the mainframes are not secure. It means that they can only batch process transactions like somewhat inefficiently and irregularly. Mm. And you can't actually have them interface with like the latest and greatest technology. So if you have banks and governments that are running really, really old code, that's not a good thing for consumers. It means everything is slower and more expensive. So his view is... We've got to upgrade that technology. We have the capacity now. You know, he when he builds Zip2, Java debuts when he's building Zip2. And within months, he incorporates Java into Zip2. So he is someone who, in at least in this instance, and I suspect in others, but I really only study this instance, what he is sensing is there's a technology shift happening. And this industry has not kept pace, but I can push the industry in that direction. So it is like it is a world, you know, he wants a world revolution in finance and he wants to take on everybody, Vanguard, Goldman Sachs, Bank of Everyone. But underneath it is this really nuanced understanding of the code on the mainframes is old and is not serving customers well. Yeah, it's it, what you capture there is really very interesting because there is a sort of a quality of fundamental analysis in terms of like you know zeros and ones, and at the same time it's coupled with this insane ambition and also mm-hmm. a vision of the future that stretches very far out. I'd seen this interview of Peter Thiel or a clip from it actually, where he was on, um, there's a guy who has like a podcast and a video, I don't remember what the show is, but Thiel says in that interview, one of my sort of fundamental axioms is never, ever, ever compete with Elon on anything. (laughs) And he talked about how when Elon launched SpaceX and got involved with Tesla and his visions for both companies, he goes, either one of those could have been equally insane. Mm -hmm. Both would have just been impossible. And yet he succeeded uh, he took both further than than you know anyone could have imagined. And at that point, you have to concede that this is more than just luck. There's got to mm-hmm. be something that he sees that the rest of us don't see. And I think that's one of the qualities that you touched on when in your description of Elon now and, and in the book. I would agree with that. I think that, look, it's hard. And I, I don't want to speak out of school. I looked at four focused years of of his life. I'm not somebody who follows every like tweet or update or news story. I mean, friends had to text me to tell me he was going to be on SNL. That's how sort of ignorant of contemporary stuff I can be. Your joke about me be living in the 1990s was all too real, man. I would offer this though, from a close look at those four years, 
if you look at his life and his work and you see only bombast or you see only like exaggeration, like you are missing like a fundamental understanding of technology and its development that he has. It is very nuanced. And people forget this is someone who was writing code when he was in his you know earliest years, like at 11 and 12. Uh, he and his family had one of the first computers in South Africa. He sold his first piece of coding and I, I found it and obviously others have found it, but I, I wrote about it in the book. You know, he sold it to a magazine for 500 bucks. It was his first exit. From there, he builds something in college called Musk Computer Consulting, right? So he's hand building computers and then selling them. And so I think it's tempting to look at the tweets and, and some of the other things that people find that they take issue with and miss that, like, he was busy reading, like, physics journals and stuff in college. Like, this is somebody who, like, there have been physicists who have been in the room with him who have walked away impressed with his understanding of things, you know, that that obviously are beyond my reach. But I would argue that we miss in the view and then the focus on, like, the the competitiveness and the the dinosaur AirPod tweets and stuff. What we miss is the fact that, for example, you know, just days ago, he was elected to the National Academy of Engineers. And so, like, that's a list that includes Claude Shannon. It includes some of, like, the leading scientists of our time. The National Academy doesn't play celebrity favorites, right? His name isn't extra highlighted on that list. He's literally in a list with other scientists you've never heard of. But it's because of his remarkable achievements as an engineer and that does come from a fundamental understanding of technology. And so in the case of financial services, which I was looking at, he was very clear about the fact that these databases were not secure, not fast, and not serving customers well. I don't think of that anything other than a absolutely 100% spot on critique, by the way, a critique that's still in large measure true. And it was really funny because when we were when our final conversation, he she was chatting with me about it and he said, he's like, when I say these things, it's like, oh, he's like, I just think I'm saying like the sky is blue. Like it seems so obvious to me. And it is obvious to him, right? It's not obvious to the rest of us. It's obvious to him. The point that Peter made, you know, it's tied to a real competitive instinct, a, a drive. It's not, he's not the only one in this story who has that, certainly. But mm -hmm. I think if we weight the scales of public attention, it's weighted incorrectly in sort of the direction of stuff that's going to get temporary attention, but it misses all this cool science and engineering stuff. Yeah, dude, uh, there's so much to talk about in this episode. We literally could do a single episode on Elon. As you were talking, I went to do a control left search for a quote of Elon's from the book because I've got a gazillion <laughs> quotes of yours in my rundown, like over 20 pages that I pulled from the book. A quote where Elon is kind of like, sort of like dumbfounded, like, yeah, wow, no, I, I wouldn't. Teal is uh, really competitive and I'm competitive. And the fact that I'm saying that Teal's competitive tells you something about how competitive Peter Teal is. And so was Levchin. I mean, there's so many anecdotes in the book of where character after character, member after member of this mafia, what we now call the PayPal mafia, show just how competitive they were. They would, uh, as you write in the book, they like engaged each other with puzzles. Yeah. You know, like that was like how they spent their Saturday nights together. Well, and and I would add two points about it. This is like, I mean, this is why you're one of you're one of my favorite people to talk to about books because you don't just read; you take twenty pages of notes. And <laughs> and we get into you. You have a broad range view of these things. I would offer two other observations. One is, you know, the competitiveness wasn't just limited to like companies or success; it infected every part of the culture, right? So there's this amazing anecdote that did not make it into the book. But I did write about it where there's this employee who remembered and recalled to me that he was, his name was Cameron Bigger, and he was Elon's sparring partner on Street Fighter. So the company had a Street Fighter arcade wow. game in its like break room. And Cameron had used wonderful. He recounted to me, he said, yeah, every now and again, he's like, Elon would walk over and he would just give me this nod. And I, the, I mean, I'm, what's the nod? And he goes, that meant I had to get up and go play him in Street Fighter. And I, and I said, <laughs> I, I was like, wait, tell me more about this. And he told me, he said, you know, Elon was so good at Street Fighter that there weren't many people at the company who could hold their own, but I could. And he goes, he's like, even I, he's like, I wasn't as good as him, but I could at least give him like a decent run for his money. So if the boss, the CEO of the company came over and gave me this little, like just a little head <laughs> nod, I had to go over there and we would play. And wow. he was so good that no one else could beat him. And I could at least like... Like, he's like, you know, maybe I'd win one out of three games. Maybe I'd come close. But he's like, at the last game, the health meter would always be like, he remembered this very vividly. And I thought of it as such a wonderful moment because the competitiveness isn't just about building the best payment services company in the world or about, you know, whatever else. It's really, a, it really is affects everything. I'll share a second story, which I did not make it into the book. There's a moment that someone described to me about the team on the Confinity side goes out to dinner. 
They're in Palo Alto. They got to dinner someplace a little further from their office, a drive away. So they didn't just walk. There are two cars. And Max Levchin is behind the wheel of one of the cars. And Peter gets in as a passenger in another car. And somehow the cars are driving next to each other. And this turns into a race. And so Peter Thiel is egging on the driver of the second car to defeat Max Levchin in the utterly ordinary task of getting back to the office after dinner. And so these cars are just racing down the streets of Palo Alto. Peter is like egging this driver on, like really telling him like, hey, go, go, go. The car that Peter's in pulls into the office first. <laughs> it parks. Peter gets out and like a boxer who has just defeated his opponent, like starts like jumping up and down with joy that they have defeated the opponent in the simple task of driving home from dinner. So when I say competitive, I mean competitive at a level that I'm not sure like any of us could fully appreciate, but it's about everything. And by the way, I would argue it's one of the things that makes the company successful because yeah. this is what kept them on their toes. Yeah, so I found one of the, uh, by the way, uh, Street Fighter 1990s. Talk about the 1990s <laughs> Street Fighter. Which character did Elon like to oh, use? Did you so, ask? You know, this is how you know you're, you're a good interviewer. I asked that exact question to the person, Cameron, who had told me that story, and he couldn't recall who it was, really? like whether it was Ryu or, or whatever. I would have guessed Ra I feel like I would have guessed Ra Maybe not. Maybe I would have guessed, what's his name, that Brazilian... Uh, who was that Brazilian Zanga? player? Is that, it Z Zang Zangif? Zangif? No, that know, Zangif that is the was Russian. some other name for the yeah. uh, Brazilian that was some, you know, an attempt to sort of incorporate jujitsu into something, but right. it wasn't really. Right. It was that animal guy. So here, yeah. I want to just, since I have it here in front of me, as I said, I basically transcribed your entire book into my rundown, but something that speaks to Teal's competitiveness, and this is from your work, from your book. For work breaks, Levchin, Teal, and Powers played chess and card games. And in these casual contests, Powers saw a striking similarity between Teal and Levchin, cutthroat competitiveness. Once sitting at Printer's INC, Powers bested Teal at a coin game called 357, also known as the matchstick game. Frustrated, Teal paused the contest to run the game's underlying math with pencil and paper. Calculations complete, Teal beat Powers in every subsequent round. Quote, I learned a lot about Peter from doing that, Powers recalled. He's going to make decisions based on some type of scientific basis rather than just shooting the gun and seeing where it goes later. That captured for me so well the image that you portray, that you sketch together in your book of Peter Thiel. Do you think that's accurate? Do you think that accurately captures kind of who he is, deliberately focused, insanely intellectually curious, but unlike people like me, for example, who are more generally curious, he was so hyper-focused. He was generally curious until he, he arrived at something that was worth focusing on, and then he focused on it to the detriment of other things to make sure that he won or he bested at it. Yeah. I mean, I, look, I, I don't want to over-interpret an anecdote. The story is amazing and it's accurate. And you're right. It captures that side of him that is competitive. It's kind of amazing to think about because it's it's just a game at a bar, right? So so the idea of, of running math about this bar game, the, the thing I'll say is the thoughtfulness that you point out, meaning the deliberate level of thinking, is I think something I walk away with in terms of understanding who Peter is and, and how he operates. Let me add one qualifier, though. You know, he doesn't believe in competition for its own sake. He's competitive, but he's competitive up to a point. And that point is when competition becomes irrational. And so a great example of that is when Confinity is competing against X.com, Basically, Peter sees that, you know, he sees this guy, Elon, a better capitalized X.com with this guy, Elon, on the other side of the table. And he's like, you know, this is going to get ridiculous. Like, we're just yeah. going to spend each other into oblivion. So that competition is not a fight to the death. And he's one of the key forces behind pushing for pushing his board and pushing his team to say, hey, we, we're not going to beat this guy. We're not going to beat X. We have to we have to find a way to create a merger. So I do think of it as competitiveness, but it's competitiveness with a certain rationality around when it makes sense to compete and when it yeah. makes sense not to. I also, I mean, that is obviously a, a hallmark of his book, Zero to One. I like the competitiveness mostly because I think of it as something actually really endearing about the PayPal culture. And I would see it even when they communicated with me, I would see it. Like they would call me out on things and like push back. Like it was a sort of aggressiveness that makes you better. Like you could never come into an interview with one of these people ill-prepared, right? And I was like, wow, like that, you know, it forces even the person who's writing about them to raise their game. 
that is what I take from it. I take to be a kind of charming, but also like, wow, like an enlivening thing that's a part of the place. Totally. No doubt about it. And I picked up on that that commitment to rationality and being logical and useful with your attention on the part of Peter Thiel. It's interesting to compare that to the story of Gawker, which I'm familiar with, somewhat familiar with, and how Peter, I think in that case, what you saw was Peter's sense of right and wrong and his justified vindictiveness in the case of Gawker and wanting to take them down and how he could summon all his attention and focus towards doing something that everyone told him was impossible. It was kind of another example of that. Not that that's in the book. So let's, again, because we could go everywhere and I want to I want to bring us back in focus. We could start with Thiel and Levchin's partnership, how they got together, the founding of X.com. Where do you think that would be an interesting place to start, recognizing that we have a limited amount of time to go through what is really a, an endlessly fascinating history? I think the partnership of Thiel and Levchin is incredibly interesting because I think mostly they tend to be written of as individuals, you know, so especially after the success of of a firm and the things Max has done and Peter obviously has a big global presence in different respects and Musk is who Musk is. One of the more interesting pieces of the story is this partnership is you have Peter Thiel, a young investor who no one knows, and this kid, I mean, his kid, he's fresh out of school. His name is Max Levchin. You know, he moves out to the Valley. That partnership, it wasn't my observation. There was a board member, John Malloy, who pointed out, he said, you know, co-founder relationships can be very, very hard. And he said, and I think I'm roughly paraphrasing, he said, they were very lucky to have each other, right? That that Max and Peter were actually very lucky to have found each other. And I, I when I walk away from the story, I do think of them as this fascinating business partnership for a few reasons. One is intellectually, they're on par with one another, meaning it isn't that Peter kind of can do the chess games and could do the math. Max is no slouch. He's there right there with him in terms of that capability to have that kind of mind. The second thing, you know, what that Max always pointed out He's pointed out in other forums, and he he spoke about it with me as well, was Peter would discipline Max's attention to focus on things that weren't just hard problems to solve, but were also valuable problems to solve. Mm -hmm. So there's this story that essentially a year after the company launches that, that Palm Pilot beaming product, Max is still servicing the Palm Pilot beaming product and, and other mobile products. And I guess at one point, Late one night, Peter had walked in the office and Max was there working. And he said, Max, what are you working on? And he said, oh, I'm like, I'm doing some bug fixing for the Palm Pilot product. And, and you know, the description that Max gave on, a, on another podcast, he said something like, and Peter just went crazy. He was like, you're the CTO of the company. We have a product with millions of users and you're servicing bugs for the product that has 13,000 users. I can't have you using your attention in this way. There's a related story where, which is the genesis, I think, of what became Max's fun, which is called Hard Valuable Fun. HVF, hard, valuable, fun. And the valuable part he attributes to Peter Thiel because at one point, Peter had asked him about a problem he was solving. He said, well, why are you doing it? And he goes, oh, because it's really hard. And Peter looked at him, I guess, and it may have been the same story. He said, well, but is it valuable? And it was a question that stayed with Max because he had a tendency that I think is true for a lot of high achievers to assume that if something is difficult, it is also valuable. But what Peter did was shifted the frame of his, his sort of frame of reference to say it can be hard and hard is great, but you can beat your head against a wall and the wall will never give. And even if it gives, what did you achieve, right? And mm -hmm. so there's this quality of Peter focusing Max's energy and talent on valuable problems. And obviously, it's not, it, look, we're not talking about like, there's no sort of, uh, I think this happens in small moments, not like there's not some big conversation. It's like sort of all the time, but there's a hard headedness and a practicality that Peter brings but also a kind of like engineering raw horsepower that Max brings that I think of as as a really incredible partnership that, you know, helps to start this company in late 1998. I would say the other thing it does is it sets an insanely high bar for the kinds of people who are going to join the company because you're not, you're talking about people who are at, sort of at the outer edge of their intellect and their drive. And so it sets a different tone for who's going to join the company. It's also interesting to remember that PayPal was founded kind of at the tail end of the 90s internet boom. And man, Max Levchin's own decision to go to University of Illinois, Champana, Urbain was because of people like Andreessen, who founded Netscape, and which Netscape went public, I think, in 1994. 1995, right? if I remember 1995. correctly. 1995. Okay. So before PayPal was founded. So 
it just tells you a lot about the culture. It tells you a lot about what had already been achieved at that time and the expectations. And I think the best example of that, again, is Elon, right? Because Elon had founded Zip2 and he sold mm-hmm. Zip2 for how much? What was it? Like $300 million? Yeah. So the, the company Zip2 sells to Compaq for, I think it was $307 million. Dude, I mean, just to say, that's just amazing. Like I did yeah. not know that. Again, too, I just want to emphasize something or reiterate something that you said. I'm one of those people that I have often taken a critical view of Elon because of many of the things that he does that I I do, uh, I, I in many ways abhor, stuff that we've covered on this podcast. And yet I think that that has biased me from investigating deeper into just uh, how accomplished he is and that, you know, really he is a much more three-dimensional character than even I, you know, gave him credit for. And uh, so I just wanted to, to preface that or to reiterate that before you continue, yeah. but please, please go ahead. No, it's, you know, I think it's, and again, I, I came into this somewhat as a tabula rasa. I don't really write about tech, you know, I do history. So this is a different sort of project for me, meaning I didn't come in with any, I, I kind of couldn't have preconceptions because if you don't read or follow a field super closely, you're sort of like not going to have preconceptions. So I just started at the beginning. When I started talking to Elon, I said the same question I asked everybody else, tell me what you were doing right before PayPal. And where it started for him was arriving in the United States as an immigrant, then coming out to Silicon Valley and really having a choice. Does he go to graduate school? Does he join a company or does he start a company? And at the time, the internet's taking off. So he is one of that early generation. People forget this. Again, it's so easy to forget. He was one of the first to dive into the internet in this way, create a company from scratch. It has some success. It sells to Compaq. For him, it was a qualified success. He felt like the technology never got to achieve what he wanted to see on the internet. But it gives him financial breathing room and an exit. Now, what's all the more remarkable is, you know, he has some newfound wealth and pours almost all of it back into his next company and takes an enormous risk with no safety net. You know, he doesn't come from kind of wealth. He's very little, you know, and instead of sort of retiring and sitting on a beach, the guy takes the vast majority of his windfall and says, I'm going to do X.com and I'm betting everything I got on it. Now, there's some reasons for that, but by any measure, it's a huge amount of personal risk. He commented to me and obviously has commented in other places, like you got to have skin in the game. And it's remarkable. I also think of it as, you know, it was useful to study his life before he became like a brand, right? Like now he is this figure that you you can't really, you know, everyone's going to have their opinion or their little thing or the thing they noticed. I was grateful for the chance to go back and talk to him about the years before it all became what it is now, where now mm. I, it's like a word cloud, right? Like he's a word cloud. He's less of a human and more of just like an abstract painting, right? But I was speaking to him about decisions like going to grad school, right? Like he had a, he got into Stanford for material science and engineering and he had a choice to make about whether to go to grad school or defer. A choice that is faced by all of us mere mortals, right? Every ge- new generation of people who are leaving college. And he decides to go and build Zip2. And even Zip2 is not a perfect like, hey, I'm going to do vector maps and we're going we're gonna to have businesses sign up. It was not perfect. It started out as called Global Link Information Network. And then it changes its name and they settle on Zip2. And after that success to go and to risk it all again, I think it's remarkable by any measure, no matter what you think of of other things, it is remarkable to take that much risk, put it on the table all over again, and to somehow have this conviction that you're going to be successful. So yeah, it's just a lot, you know, we're we're sort of floating around things, but I I think that the, these transitions in people's lives that happened in the early 20s are the reason I did this book because they're caricatures now, like all of these people. And but like even people you've never heard of today who started their careers there, you know, they, their lives are not anything resembling normal. But back in 1998, when Max Levchin is arriving from UIUC, his life looks a lot more like, like you and I, right? And that to me, like those decision points are fascinating. Well, I mean, that's how Levchin, ironically, if Levchin didn't have the economic standing that he had at the time, which was not particularly wealthy, he wouldn't have been attending lectures to benefit from the air conditioning and therefore had met Peter Thiel, which is how the two of them had met. I also want to emphasize something that you, you didn't explicitly say in this interview, but which you've written about in the book, which is that Elon Musk's bank account 
went from $5,000 to $21 million overnight when he got that check for Zip2. And he, I think he put, what, 13 or 14 of that million, yeah. 21 million into X.com, which is, yeah. and, and again, you said there are lots of reasons for that. One of the reasons for that came to inform really the, the entire venture industry, which was that he wanted to have more, not just skin in the game, but by having skin in the game, having more control over mm -hmm. the fate of his company and the ability to signal to his employees and other people joining the firm that he was serious, that he was fully committed, that there was no exit strategy. And Peter Thiel similarly created Founders Fund for that same reason of wanting to give more power, more skin in the game to founders, because at the time that these guys came around, the conventional wisdom in Silicon Valley was that once you you know, get a company beyond sort of the death stages of the early startup phase, you bring in an adult, you bring in a CEO mm -hmm. who's an established guy, a Jeff Scully type, a la Apple. So again, there's so many places that we can go. I want to bring it back though to the PayPal story. You know, in reading the history of this company, it seemed to me that one of the very early, if not the most important early moment, at least on the Confinity side, was the transition from the Palm Pilots and the IR ports, you know, beaming, <laughs> yeah. beaming money to emailing, emailing mm -hmm. payments, which ultimately led to the eBay wars, the wars on the eBay platform between X.com and Confinity, which really drove them into a merger, which is ultimately how we got, you know, the PayPal that we know today. Can you walk me through that story, both the move to email and then eventually how these two companies came to converge on the same e-commerce platform sure. from which they ended up merging? Yeah, it shows you, you can often be sort of a, a solution looking for a problem, right? And I think it's the best evidence I've seen for that. So to give your readers context again, Confinity launches this product called PayPal and PayPal is Palm Pilot money beaming. And the idea is like, you and I have a Palm Pilot, we're at lunch, I give you 10 bucks to cover my share. Except that the ceiling on people who have Palm Pilots is very low relative to the US population. And then the ceiling on people who have Palm Pilots and have downloaded the PayPal application and have it happen to be at the same lunch is even lower. And over the summer of 1999, part of what happens is friends and advisors to Confinity begin to critique this product, right? And they're like, look, you are not going to, this isn't going to go anywhere. So one of the people who offers a critique is Reed Hoffman. And Reed and Max talked about one late night meeting during that summer of 1999. The product is launched, but the phones aren't ringing off the hook with people trying to download the Palm Pilot app. And Reed is pretty forceful in saying like, oh, he's the way he cited to me later. He's like, it's over on this idea. You're hosed, right? And Max Levchin, in response to that critique, in concedes and says, look, well, why don't we put something on the, on the website that allows people to email money in case they forget their Palm Pilots or they don't have a Palm Pilot? And it's a concession. It's not the core product. It's a concession. And it's a concession to Reed Hoffman's pushback about the product design. So Max goes off and, and he and his team, and the engineering, they build this email money companion product. And very quickly, it becomes apparent to Levchin himself that the email money companion product is a really quick way to test all the plumbing of the payment system. Like he described it to me, he said, you know, it should have been, a, he has said it in other places, and I think he said it to me as well, it should have been a clue, like when I was the one using the email money product to make sure everything was working. So that is the inadvertent creation of the core PayPal emailing money from one person to another technology. And what starts to happen is, you know, they very quickly get signals like, okay, this is going to be a thing. David Sachs is another person who joins a company around this time. And he has a similar critique to Reid Hoffman in like the limited prospects for Palm Pilot money beaming. And he himself says, look, if I'm only going to join, he tells Peter, I'm only going to join the company if you actually make emailing money like the key product. And you have, you have all these other sort of like voices around who are saying, look, this might actually be a thing. Mm. That product launches. X.com is working on a similar product around emailing money. Both companies in late 1999 are still very, very like, what is this going to be? We don't know. But then they both find a home. And where they find a home is this, I think now at that time it would have been five years old, maybe six year old auction website called eBay. And eBay is, a, it, by this point, it's one of the internet's success stories. It's become a public company, right? It was founded by Piero Midyar as this sort of, this called thing called Auction Web that it was like a buried in a corner of his website as well. 
eBay has figured out many things, including building like the world's foremost digital auction infrastructure. They have not waded into the waters of figuring out exactly how people are going to pay for goods they buy or that sort of thing. So they've like allowed their users to decide how payments are going to be reconciled after the auction is done. Into that maelstrom steps, Confinity's PayPal product and X.com's emailing money product. When all of a sudden eBay buyers and sellers are like, well, this is the easiest way to pay for you know whatever I'm buying, whatever Beanie Babies, collectibles, et cetera. And then what happens is the products start to take off virally from there because these communities, the eBay communities are super vocal and super active. They communicate about everything and they start to share the fact that these two products exist and also that these two products have bonuses attached so that if you sign up for a PayPal account, I'm the one who signed you up, you get 10 bucks and I get an extra 10 bucks because I signed you up. And so this is where these two products nest and start to really find a home. And it's where the battle between these two companies begins for supremacy. Yeah. And I, I totally want to talk about that sort of affiliate marketing structure because it's a core part of what had later became called blitz scaling by Reed Hoffman, who you mentioned was another one of these star-studded members of the PayPal mafia. Another thing that I found fascinating in the book was that they didn't even realize that they were crushing it on eBay. Neither one of the teams realized this. They discovered it sort of uh, after the fact. Walk me through that realization and what and how it altered the companies. How it was kind of a, it also became this sort of two-edged sword. It was both yeah. a blessing and a curse. Yeah, it's actually one of my favorite moments in the whole book, which is you look back and Confinity has launched PayPal. PayPal has started to take off on eBay. And the way that the team <laughs> learns, because I did some digging, right? I sort of like sussed around, like, where did you, how did you figure out? And what it seems to have come down to is they don't, they still don't know who Patient Zero was, by the way. They don't know who the original like kind of person was. But a customer service request came in to the Confinity team from a person who wanted help resizing the PayPal logo so they could put it on their auction page for a specific product. And this logo resizing request got forwarded to David Sachs and a few other people. And the way David Sachs tells the story, you know, they're there late one night, the customer service request comes in. It's one of several thousand coming in because the whole thing is just like a hair on fire exercise of customer growth. And they asked the question like, well, wait, we didn't know somebody was using us on eBay. Let's go look at eBay and see, like, let's type in PayPal. They type in PayPal into eBay's search bar and just you know, dozens, hundreds of auction listings pop into view. And they've realized now like, oh, wow, we're hot here. This is amazing. How cool is this? That's David Sachs's reaction. Max Levchin's reaction is not that. Uh, he's actually quite unhappy about this. He actually blocks for a period, for a very brief period, the, I, the uh, IP addresses that are, makes it impossible for eBay users essentially to use PayPal, right? And a kind of decision or disagreement breaks out within the team and it gets to the board as well. Like, wait, what are we doing? We didn't set out to design an eBay payment system, right? We want it to be X or Y or Z, except that you can't ignore success. You can't ignore the fact that all these people are actually promoting your product, that they're not just use your product, by the way, they're promoting your product because they benefit from it because of the referral fees. And eventually what happens is the team very, very, very quickly recognizes, okay, we've achieved the sort of hallowed, hallowed ground of product market fit, right? And this is what this looks like. So David Sachs, who is relentless about this, essentially like reorients his product team around understanding everything they can about eBay. So I have this great series of interactions with one of the sharpest people I interviewed. Her name was Denise Aptekar. And Denise talked about, she's like, David said, everyone on the team, we have to go like buy and sell on eBay. Like I've got to go buy stuff on eBay because we have to dissect every part of this process from the, the initial bid, what happens when the bid's done? What does the email look like when the bid is done? Where can we put PayPal in the process? She buys a landline phone and it arrives caked in cigarette smoke is the way that she had described it, that it shows up. And she and others, like they had doubts, like, wait, we're on an auction website. Is that the place for us? But you couldn't, again, ignore the rising number of people in this community who saw in PayPal a way to make a clean payment. And so the company starts to essentially create little, little devices, tools, hacks, other mechanisms by which PayPal will become the default or a very prominent payment mechanism for eBay. 
And that's the origin. That's the sort of, you know, when you go back to it, it's not like they had thought, by the way, that like people would use it for remittances, like sending money cross border. They thought that maybe people would use it to square up lunch tabs. They thought that like actually parents would want to send college money to like like money to their kids over email. But the principal place where this first big group of users comes from is this auction website. Ironically, an auction website that many on this team found like sort of vaguely distasteful. Like they were like, oh, it's like a flea market. You know, it's like this weird online flea market. I'm never going to, we're never going to be a thing there. Um, They become successful there. And then they fuel that success in some very innovative ways. Mm. Yeah, it's absolutely fascinating. And I love the entire discussion of the book because there you devote so much of the book to this, to really describing how they not only overcome challenges, but their approach to to dealing with them in real time. And again, this company scaled in like, what, just a few years, right? It was officially founded yeah. in 1998 and it went public by 2002, very early. And of course, its public offering was like right after 9-11. Yeah. I think they were, they were like yeah. the first one. So challenge after challenge. I want to talk about those innovations. I mentioned blitz scaling, which I found most, I guess, it wasn't the most detailed part of the book. There's only so much you can sort of devote to that. But I found it the most interesting because in the years since PayPal's launch, and certainly since it IPO'd, we've lived in, uh, in a world of lower and lower interest rates, hmm. cheaper and cheaper money and more and more money. And that's altered the incentives of companies all the way down the innovation stack, so to speak, or cycle. And more and more companies sort of hack growth in this way today. Mm -hmm. Some successfully, some simply using it as a crush. And I'm fascinated to discuss with you the legacy of PayPal, not just in this area, but in all sorts of areas where they innovated, where they changed the game, how they dealt with fraud, et cetera. For anyone new to the program, Hidden Forces is listener supported. We don't accept advertisers or commercial sponsors. The entire show is funded from top to bottom by listeners like you. If you want access to the second part of today's conversation with Jimmy, as well as the episode transcripts and intelligence reports, head over to hiddenforces.io and check out our episode library, where you can also become a premium subscriber today. Jimmy, stick around. We're going to move the second half of our conversation onto the premium feed. For more information about this week's episode, or if you want easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you want access to full episodes, transcripts, and intelligence reports, which include additional notes, resources, links, and other material that will help you get the most out of each and every episode, check out our premium subscription available through the Hidden Forces website at hiddenforces.io. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. Join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.